Hello, I'm Bob Norton, CEO of Airtight Management and creator of the CEO and Entrepreneur Bootcamp. This section is on product and service development at light speed. It's about how to get 10 times the amount of efficiency or productivity, as well as potentially 10 times the innovation to happen in any sort of product or service development effort. And it really is, although we'll use examples that are technology and software, it's really not about any particular kind of product development because these principles are about people. They're about management. They're about culture. They're about managing an innovation team. So let's look at our goals for this segment. First, we're going to do a case study on one of the most successful R&D projects that we know of in all of history, certainly one of the, the top projects in the last century. That's called the SR-71 Blackbird. And it was developed at Lockheed Martin in the 1960s. And we're going to do a quick fly through of a case study about what they did and how and what they accomplished. And then we're going to talk about what made that possible. And there's many, many things. There's a 12-step set of lessons at the end of this segment that are the rules to get that kind of huge boost in productivity. Second, we're going to see how you get that 10x productivity and also get lower costs and faster delivery. Now, those things might sound mutually exclusive or like they would fight each other, but the reality is they don't, and, and you're going to see that. So we'll go through the 12 unbreakable rules of dramatic product improvement in, in productivity and innovation. And these are often called skunk works rules. A lot of this was developed independently uh, by Lockheed Martin, I guess, back in the 50s and 60s. But I sort of reinvented these myself for small companies in a software environment early in my career. What allows me to do this and understand this is the first eight years of my career was spent in product development. And I started as a software engineer, went to a senior systems engineer doing all kinds of super techie stuff with operating systems and security, and uh, both on mainframes and, and microcomputers and then on mini computers as well. And I ran large groups, up to 60 uh, people uh, engineering. Uh, as I became director of software development and then ultimately VP of engineering and chief technical officer at Thompson Financial Services, which today is called Thompson Reuters, and was very successful. As a matter of fact, the, the five products I developed there had a 100% launch success rate. And a couple of them became worldwide monopolies because they were enough of a leap of innovation over the competitors to really dominate the market. And lastly, in this section, we'll review a product management framework that leverages all these proven principles. And of course, a lot of this is about culture and management and leadership and understanding those kind of softer arts as opposed to the, the science of the limits and the rules that you'll find in the, in the 12 unbreakable rules that I've created. So let's go. First, we're going to look at the SR-71. This plane is, is and was the fastest plane in the world for over 40 years. It can fly to New York from Los Angeles or vice versa in an hour, and it did this in the 1960s. As a matter of fact, it was probably responsible for a lot of UFO sightings flying out of Area 51, where it was tested, as well as the other stealth aircraft back in the 60s. So this thing goes so fast that it, it's, three time, it's two and a half times faster than the, S, the SST Concorde, I believe. But this is one of the most successful development efforts in the 20th century, and yet it lasted 40 years and was so successful that it was constantly brought back in to do things even after satellites and the Keyhole satellite system was started that could read a golf ball from satellite orbit, these things were actually brought back because they could do things that even the newer technology couldn't. 
So let's look at some of the amazing things at this engineering feat. Uh, the first flight was on uh, December 22nd of 1964, and it came out of Palmdale, California Test Center. This thing is now more than 50 years old. It's been retired, but it dominated its space for about 40 years as a surveillance platform that flew so fast and so high that one was never shot down, even though during the Cold War of the 60s and 70s and even through the 80s and the Vietnam War and other areas that we had to uh, surveil, uh, not one was shot down, even though over a thousand surface-to-air missiles or SAMs were launched at it because it was so fast and so high. This aircraft set a whole bunch of world speed records. As, as I mentioned, it took a very short time to uh, go from Los Angeles to LA. The SS, uh, SST took nine hours, and this did it in less than half that time. It was uh, two, uh, two, 2 one uh, times slower. This thing flies so high that the pilots actually need to wear spacesuits. Here's a picture of the assembly floor at Lockheed Martin back in the 60s, uh, as well as a photo from the cockpit of an SR-71. And if you look closely, you'll actually see that you'll see a little bit of the curvature of the Earth in there, because this essentially is in space at 80,000 feet high. So as I said earlier, the Russians tried to shoot this down many times, taking pictures of the ICBM sites and what was happening in, in Russia and the various military installations, etc. And so this was the key way that we collected information throughout the second half of the 60s, the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s and 2000s. So this thing actually had a perfect record. And the reason is it was so far ahead, such a big leap over the previous technology that nothing that the Russians did as a counter to tactic really worked. This was established, oh, this project was, was created because the U-2 spy plane was shot down over Russia and the U-2 spy plane was the previous surveillance platform to fly over the Soviet Union at the time, the USSR, right? Today, it's just Russia and all the satellite states are, are independent. But back then, this was a huge portion of the continent that it had to fly over. And so these people were on uh, 12 and 13 hour missions, I think, uh, oftentimes, and it refueled in the air, but not one was shot down. The Top speed, at least uh, what they allow us to see, is that the Mach 3.2, uh, or about 2,500 miles an hour, uh, flying at 80 to 80,000 feet. And it was typically, for an aircraft, it was a three to five year development cycle at that time. Remember, they didn't have computers, they didn't have simulations and CAD and all this sort of thing. And so you're typically looking at a three to five year time frame to develop a new aircraft. But this was developed in only 18 months and had a lot fewer people on the project. And as a result, of course, the, the development project cost actually a fraction of what the normal development of an airplane would be because there were fewer people for far less time. So it wasn't half the cost. It was like 20% of the cost, and yet, in spite of that lower manpower, the result was that they came up with an aircraft that was probably 10, 20, and maybe even arguably 30 years ahead of its time. So the SR-71 uh, Blackbird is the fastest plane ever built, and it still was 40 years after it was built. It was actually the first stealth technology. A lot of people don't know that, but when you look at it, you see that familiar uh, black non-reflective paint coating that was developed back in the 60s by the military. It was the highest flying plane ever. It was designed, as I said, in less than a third of the time than the typical uh, aircraft development project would be. It was never shot down, and basically it was superior in every way, 
for its specific mission. And it's important to qualify for that, right? It was built for one purpose. And we'll see why it was so successful because of that focus of purpose and clarity. And, and this created serious competitive advantage. As any new product should be, for any startup, it should be as big a leap forward over what's available from the competition today as is possible so that you can grab market share quickly before people copy what you did and try to come out with clones for what you did. And that's one of the reasons companies like Apple develop for many years in secrecy before they release a product because, you know, they want to come out with a, a product that's such a leapfrog over the competition that it will take years for the competitors to catch up because they spent years developing it and kept their ideas secret during that development period. It was cheaper than most planes to produce, probably uh, considered a, a joke nowadays, but this plane cost 33 to $34 million to build back then. I, I believe a single fighter aircraft, which is a small fraction of the, the size, in some ways the speed and sophistication of this, would, would cost 10 or 20 times that today. And also, it was pulled out of mothballs during the Gulf War because it could do things that still are, as I said, our satellite system and other surveillance planes that had been developed in the previous 30 years still hadn't been able to design in those capabilities. And it was probably, as I said, likely responsible for a lot of UFO sightings flying at night so fast at Mach 3.2 that I'm sure many people thought this was a, a UFO when it was spotted. 